So the previous weeks I uh, talked about uh, the ten kusala karma and the ten akusala karmas, which uh, help us develop uh, a good foundation when we are practicing the Eightfold Noble Path. <coughs> for they uh, give us a much more deeper insight into the Eightfold Noble Path because of their qualities can be found in the Eightfold Noble Path. And thus the Eightfold Noble Path can be divided into three areas of body, speech and mind. <coughs> and thus the, this primary concern <coughs> of these uh, three areas is uh, also uh, we can see something else is happening there and that is our, our actions. Our actions are done on three different levels. There is the levels done, actions done by the body, actions done by the speech and actions done by the mind. And action in particular means uh, uh, gaya o karma. Vaji karma, mano karma. So, in a sense, uh, action sense of making karma. Now, uh, as we understand from my previous talk a few weeks ago, which discussed these uh, factors, we have a choice to making good karma or uh, bad karma. And this, as Buddhists, we are looking towards reducing doing bad or evil karma and increasing wholesome good karma. So this is our primary concern as Buddhists. If we are to call ourselves Buddhists, we are interested in this area in particular. <clears throat> so with this uh, area, this gives us uh, the ability to be able to walk on the Eightfold Noble Path. For if we aren't developing uh, the Kusala Karma, wholesome karmas, then we are we are not practicing the Eightfold Noble Path and we don't have, we don't even have the first factor which is right view. <coughs> so just to uh, um, revise those ten Akusala Karmas and on, on that of the body and that is uh, one abstaining from the destruction of life, abstaining from taking what is not given and abstaining from sexual misconduct. Now, of course, I've talked about them in detail, and I won't go again through that because uh, that is not what this talk's um, aiming at. <clears throat> and on the level of speech, abstains from false speech, he abstains from the decisive speech, um, and also abstains from harsh speech, and abstains from idle chatter. And then on the level of the mind, uh, we are looking at three main areas and that is, uh, I will go into detail because it is a very important one. He does not long for the wealth and property of others, thus, oh may what belongs to another belong to myself, be mine. And uh, this one, we uh, covetousness, you see in many, many books is uh, this quality of covetousness. Uh, uh, this word that they use to translate that. But here we just use a very more simple term, longing, desire for things. <clears throat> and uh, the second quote is he, uh, he has goodwill and his intentions are free of hate. Thus may these beings live happily, free from enmity and affliction and anxiety. So, uh, so uh, again, that is... Uh, uh, showing uh, these two uh, main factors of the, the mind, which also in uh, right intention, this is correct because uh, this is what is happening in the mind, as the Lord Buddha says, ne karma sankapo abhayapada sankapo, these two qualities, and, that is, and the first one being reducing one's uh, uh, obsession with sensuality, you know, looking to uh, for material uh, happiness, always seeking out oneself for material happiness. In the first aspect, funny enough, when we do meditate, is the monkey mind always jumping and going into a distracted state. And this distracted state is concerned about one primary thing, and that is longing for things. Oh, I want this, I want this new, new mobile phone, or... I'm thinking about dinner and this, always thinking about some 
type of uh, aspect of one's life, uh, which is actually quite useless because we are just sitting calmly and there's no point thinking about those things, really. And so when we consider it like that, we can see how powerful this quality of longing. And what is this longing? This longing has, says Tanha and Upadana, has these two qualities which are the fundamental principles, principles of Kilesa, which are the defilements of the mind. And they are that of desire and attachment. So if we have these two qualities uh, and we are not uh, carefully uh, understanding the harm in them, then we're promoting them. And so doing that, the first aspect on the level of the mind um, is of this in particular thing, is working with this strong desire and attachment, this longing and understanding. And so when we do practice the Eightfold Path, we see quite clearly our intention in our mind. Intention is jetana, and that is a level of the mind. So that's excellent. And that's why I use these ten Akusala Karmas, because they very much give us a deep insight how to develop the Eightfold Noble Path, if we're looking at it uh, and breaking it down and analysing it and trying to understand skill in developing it. <coughs> so with, with that, having this uh, developing of right intention <coughs> and understanding this quality of near karma, then uh, we are reducing that uh, interest and we are looking more at uh, being uh, developing a sense of moderation in, uh, in external material happiness and, and trying to live a more uh, balanced life instead of going to uh, uh, these uh, extreme uh, beha modes of behaviour. And you can see this now in modern society, people are using credit cards all the time. And Lord Buddha said in the development of the conduct for laity, Buddhist laity, is, uh, is one of the happiness is to be free of debt. So, and now with all this longing, it's just increasing people to be in debt and they can't pay off things. It's pretty much everything most people own these days are is in debt on the visa card. And they come on a point where they are, you know, go into deep dire straits and they, you know, have to mortgage the home and so forth. And, and uh, even uh, maybe lose their job. So Lord Buddha always said that livelihood is very important. And again, what we're looking at is the Eightfold Noble Path. It's establishing secure, stable livelihood so we can practice the Noble Eightfold Path in, in comfort and at ease. So if we don't have comfort at ease, then there's no way that we can have a stable mind. So again, that's just giving one point of uh, tangent there to give us this understanding how valuable it is and uh, the consequences of longing, how it just imbalances our lives and our also maybe potentially our livelihood as well. <coughs> so in the second aspect of Manokama, he is of goodwill and his intentions free of, free of hate. So this, this, this quality is, uh, again, we see in Abhayapada Sangapo in uh, on right intention, that is the intention uh, not to uh, not to uh, <clears throat> harm other beings, not to kill, not to harm, and so forth. So, with this quality, what we're seeing, which is what I'll be leading into this talk about, is the development of the four Brahma Viharas, and that is uh, that is uh, metta, karuna, mudita, upeka. These four qualities that that are very much bright states of mind, incredibly wholesome states of mind. And uh, they are very much entwined with uh, developing the Eightfold Path. They sort of go hand in hand and also are to be evident when the mind is developed and more mature in its Buddhist practice. And we'll see those qualities. And so that's the Lord Buddha saying what are one of the effects is uh, what's quite clear uh, from, a, from an early period is that most, most people who are Buddhists have a quality of compassion and consideration for others and actually... Uh, are quite patient people and quite peaceful, and this is uh, this is because uh, it's a very fundamental principle in uh, Lord Buddha's teachings. These qualities of peace, kindness, and compassion, and consideration of others, because this allows us to develop our mind to a greater level of stability. So, uh, so this is one of the heaviest karmas: is uh, ill will, hatred, is one of the most heaviest. Uh, karmas that brings uh, a lot of uh, 
unwholesome consequences of the mind and of oneself and to others. <coughs> so uh, when we particularly understand that, then we are, we are always concerned of not generating those states of mind and, uh, and uh, are very careful around that. And uh, so our intentions are good. So our intentions are aiming towards moderation in life so we don't have too much longing and, uh, and, uh, and also uh, balance of our life so our livelihood doesn't go out of balance. And on the level of, um, of goodwill, we're developing less negativity, hatred or annoyance, anger, all these called reducing that and developing more an understanding of why we're feeling that way. We're looking to understand it, not to just react. And to understand we need the qualities of compassion because in consideration of other people. So that this, is, this is how we can see how they are developing in the mind, learning in the mind. <clears throat> and uh, finally, the, 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 the final aspect, he holds right view and he has a correct perspective thus. And this is the most, beautiful bit I really love because this shows the dynamics of right view and that is we have uh, in the Eightfold Path a, a, a certain stock description of right view but um, in, the, in the Ten Akusala Karmas it's a different altogether. It's written, it's stated in a different way and this is particular because it is uh, looking at the level of, of the mind, of the mind how it first generates right view. This is the fundamental principle that the Lord Buddha saw even in, in uh, historical India. People had this general understanding and that understanding of there was, there is what is given, sacrifice and offered, and meaning there is merit to made. This three statements is just quite clearly saying there is merit in offering and giving and helping. And as I was uh, <clears throat> speaking uh, Last Sunday, when I was giving a, a talk on uh, encouraging uh, the, all the people who are doing dana uh, and giving acts of service, they asked me to give a, a short dharma talk for a group of 100 people. And I talked on that issue about of that, of, uh, of dana and this act of giving and seeing the importance of it. And the Lord Buddha said that giving even to an animal, you know, is, is good karma. And then the next level of giving is giving to a person who is, let's say, immoral. Let's say we can say a street person or a rough person we don't know, or they could be a, a druggie or something like that. They're on the street, and uh, we're helping them. We're buying them a Big Mac or something like that. And, uh, you know, just because we feel compassionate, you know, it happens from time to time. And they, we might, people might think, I had the view, no, I shouldn't give to that people because they're corrupt, they're evil. There's nothing good in it. I had a view like that a long time ago. But then as I was analysing and developing my Buddha practice, I realised, oh, that, that, that actual mind state to say, no, I'm not going to give to that person, is actually generating, um, uh, how would you say, a, an aspect of wrong view in the mind. It's not seeing the implications, not upholding upatana, upholding this act of merit, act of generosity, which is so powerful, far-reaching. As the Lord Buddha says, he's never seen in all his previous lives and existence where the act of giving has been unbeneficial. So this is a powerful statement that we should always take to heart. And this is what is what we could say is a fundamental principle of the stain of stinginess. When we see the act of giving is not beneficial, I'm not going to give. And that's end of story. So then we, instead of saying, I'm not going to give, what can I give? What can I give? I can, let's say, if you don't have much money, so saying, oh, I can't give because I'm short of money and I've you know, got to buy my own lunch and this person's starving. But we can give compassion. We can give our acts of kindness. You see? So this is what, what we're looking at on the level of mind. You know, this, we're not looking about our body actions of actually doing some material giving, but it's actually acknowledging that even on the level of the mind, this act of giving, even though we're not doing anything. And so the Lord Buddha said, even when other people are giving and you're observing that, you can obtain, you can obtain merits from that because your quality is developing the quality of mudita, you know, joy of other people giving. And we have that because this is 
ceremony of the Katina, where uh, lots of people come at the end of the Vasa, which now we're coming up to in, in uh, this period of time, now coming to the Vasa period where the monks stay resident, put for three months, and after that there's a Katina ceremony. If there's a, if there's a large, if there's a, a body group of, of, of monks, let's say five monks, then we have a Katina ceremony, and then people offer robe cloth. And then there's a particular chant that the monks do in giving the Inamorana. And some of the verses in that saying, those great gathering of people there, even those who are not giving robe cloths, they even, even them being there, just being present and rejoicing in the goodness of other doing that, they too receive merit, you see. So that is a beautiful statement that shows show the far consequences of I'm just on a, even on the level of the mind, even if we haven't, or I wanted to give cloth, but I just forgot about it. But they're doing, oh, great, and a mordana. You know, it's, in the normal terms of mind, when it sees other people get, giving, it goes to jealousy. Oh, you know, they gave, and I should have did that. I lost my opportunity. I really wanted to give, I had a really great big chance to make some big merit, and I just missed out. But that is, again, going to wrong view in the mind. This is what we're looking at. We're trying to observe the mind and these qualities, these subtle qualities of the mind. And so then we can acknowledge this, uh, this first fundamental principle of right view, of the act of giving and, uh, and giving, uh, giving great respect and importance to it. And then the second aspect uh, is there is fruit and results of good and bad actions. There, and, uh, and, and this is excellent because this, this, this clearly quite states that, you know, uh, wholesome karma and unwholesome karma, there is results from it. And that's why the Lord Buddha divided, gave this division, uh, kusla, uh, the ten kusala karma and, uh, and, uh, and the ten kusala karmas. So the ten unwholesome karmas and the ten wholesome karmas, which are divided into three areas of body, speech and mind. So as I went at the beginning of the talk, which is uh, on, the, on the level of the body, which is of, <coughs> of, uh, of destroying, uh, destroying life or living beings uh, intentionally in that sense, um, taking what is not killing, pretty much you know, stealing or someone else's property you know that you don't have right to. And, uh, and, uh, and the third is of uh, sexual misconduct, which is breaking up of relationships. So if there's a, a mother, let's say there's a married couple, and that married couple then, and one of them decides to have an, an affair with another, uh, either married person or unmarried person, and then that family is in, is in uh, broken up, and there's a lot of unhappiness in that family because there's a, there's a, the trust has been broken in that relationship because that's how humans bond and develop relationships. It's a mutual sense of trust and respect and uh, living together, such as, uh, let's say, uh, if they are married or in a permanent relationship. So it's showing that, that this, is, uh, this is detrimental. Of course, it's much more co complex, but they're the three main areas of it, and it's the main principle of kami sumichachara. So, um, and, uh, and then we go into uh, <coughs> uh, right speech, and again, right speech is uh, uh, abstain from uh, uh, lying. You know, re, you know, for you know, quite clearly not telling the truth. Abstain from uh, decisive speech, meaning to uh, to actually deliberately break people up. So this is uh, breaking people up to make people fight, or if there's already people are fighting, to increase that, to take sides, increase that instead of developing a sense of how can we settle this and how can we have more harmony and more acceptance of other people. So again, this is again pointing at these qualities of, of uh, loving kindness and karuna, even in our speech. So you can see how far reaching uh, these five aspects are. <coughs> so, um, and then uh, we have also uh, hard speech, which is, you know, very coarse, rude speech. And again, we can see that is going the opposite direction from developing the four Brahma Viharas. And finally, uh, unskillful speech, you know, not knowing time and place and so forth and saying something that will offend someone and so forth, you know, you know, inconsiderate and so forth. Again, we can see there's no sense of karuna or... or, or or metta, you know, very much kindness or compassion there is lacking. <clears throat> and then uh, again, again, we, we come back to the far last area, which is the mind, which we are primarily concerned about here. <clears throat> 
So as I was saying, there is results of these good and bad actions. That's why we, we do these uh, good actions by body and speech and mind, because when we don't do them, then there are consequences and it uh, is detrimental to our development of our mind and also development of other spiritual qualities that we are so uh, seeking to develop. So this primary aspect of uh, developing uh, virtue is of prime importance in Buddhism and should uh, be looking at very carefully and, and with deep consideration. <clears throat> and thus another aspect is that uh, he goes on, there is uh, this world and the other world, which is imp implications of, of karma. You know, there are consequences in this life, in future lives, and so forth. And there is mother and father, meaning to uphold it. There's great importance to mother and father. And there are being spontaneously reborn. And these are very beautiful statements. Again, that's implying to karma that, you know, there's not just the three main principal types of beings that we know in the world which are womb-born, egg-born, and moisture-born, which we can, uh, science can prove. But the final one is a bit difficult, and uh, they, they, don't, they don't really know how that come about. But there is uh, much reports now of seeing ghosts and, and stuff which they cannot explain and they cannot detect, and so forth. That way it's still an enigma in science terms. <clears throat> So and this is what it's meant by spontaneous born when, uh, let's say, for in a particular in other realms, a being does not have a physical body so much as uh, we have this uh, physical body. It's much more a refined bottle that's a bit uh, on a level not so, uh, not so material, materially present. <coughs> um, <coughs> So then, and finally, it goes into uh, uh, seeing that there are, you know, Buddhist monks or ascetics who have established in Dharma practice and through their own good conduct and their practice have realized this world, the other world, and for themselves with direct knowledge, meaning they have the path open to liberation. They have seen it, they have witnessed it, and they're expounding it. And this is what we're seeing going down through the generations of monks, of these great monks, great uh, ajans of our generation, of pre previous generations have uh, been pointing out the Dharma and uh, guiding us to just keep affirming that uh, the, the Buddhist teachings are true and correct and aligned with, with what they have experienced and developed in their own practice, even though yet we have developed it, but they have affirmed it in their own practice, and that's a wonderful thing to see. <clears throat> um, and usually we don't know about these monks until they've passed away. You know, once they've passed away, disciples and laity who are supporting find out and they build shed ears and they, you know, they have relics and so forth like this. And then, and then people read their books and things like that and get a bit of insight about their lives. So that's wonderful. We still have that culture of the Aryan Sangha still around. And so now as we go into the next aspect, uh, uh, because possessing these 40 qualities, uh, one is, uh, does not have a uh, good destination, meaning that uh, the karma that they will produce uh, doing these 40 qualities will, will, won't, will be very detrimental in developing wholesome states of, uh, of body, speech and mind. And again, here you'd think, oh, it must be a new set of 40, but it's very much in fact the same set of 10 that's, uh, that's developed in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, sorry, in, uh, uh, <clears throat> in these uh, first ten aspects, where one is uh, 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 the action of one is doing oneself, and then in the second aspect, it multiplies again. One encourages others, for example, in the first precept, to destroy life. So we do it ourselves, and then we encourage others, and that's on another level of uh, so we can understand it deeply. And then on another level, we approve of it. We approve of the destruction of life. And then again, on another level, we speak in praise of it. So then we can see how far reaching implications are, how refined it is, how much we have to really develop in our practice to support these uh, 10 wholesome karmas. Not only we are doing it ourselves, promoting quietly and doing it ourselves, but we're also uh, not, uh, not encouraging the opposite. We're, we're not you know, saying, oh, you know, because I don't kill, you do it. You know, you know. By doing that, you're actually, you're, you're, you're digging your own grave, so to speak. You're not doing, you're not fulfilling 
development of wholesome states because you're saying, oh, I, I don't do that, but you can do that, that's fine. And you shouldn't even say that, okay, because that is not going to be helpful. And this is uh, Lord Buddha saw these kind of things that were happening around him and that's why he refined it to this level so that people have a deeper understanding of it, how to practice it. Because there is a lot of under misunderstanding on how to practice uh, Dharma. So that's why the Lord, Lord Buddha goes into quite detail. And then again, one approves of it. So they know, so if you see someone harming life, you don't, you don't approve of it. You might see it. You, you know, of course, you can't really do much if somebody's doing, you know, if they are being violent, you know, you, there's harm going to be happening to you. You might, you know, your life might be a threaten. Then, of course, you'll call police or something like that. You know, but you don't approve of it. You know, and this is what we see in our society. There, we have a certain level of morality code. People don't approve of it. Seeing something that's wrong, they'll call the police. Something they're doing very unlawful acts. So that's showing that quality. And the same is also, we know in in our society, we see something that's unlawful, not appropriate. We, we don't encourage it. We'll, you know, we might complain in that in that occasion. Or. Um, or, um, or we might tell our friends, oh, that's, this and this, such and such happened. They were doing this evil, wicked thing. And, you know, you know, so we're not picking in praise of it. We're just saying that's terrible. And you know, that's great. So then if we understand at those levels, then we can see how it, uh, it's, it, it, it uh, expentuates into, uh, f uh, into, into tenfold, 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 and so forth, into uh, 40. So uh, with that, we, uh, we, w once we promote all those areas, then we're, we're, we're boosting our, our, our support for it. We're doing much more than just doing it ourselves because we're considering, I want to encourage you know, not to do those acts. And I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to uh, uh, you know, doing unwholesome acts. I don't want to approve of it. And I don't want to speak in praise of it. So when we do that, we strengthen it. So then if we still have bad habits, they'll quickly, they'll quickly reduce because a habit still, has, uh, still uh, lies and dwells in us because there's something in us that is encouraging it, there's something in us that's approving it, and something in us that's you know, speaking, oh, it doesn't matter, it's okay. So the voice in ourselves. So not only externally, we can apply this internally to to fortify ourselves, to fortify ourselves in sila, to strengthen our sila, where we have weaknesses, where we have tendencies. And we all have different tendencies, and that is something we have to, it's our ongoing homework, you could say, for each individual to improve our quality of our, of our mind and uh, of, of, of developing wholesome states of mind. So, uh, <clears throat> So again, uh, so again, through those, I'll, I'll, I won't go again through those ten, but just basically, just uh, so one will uh, abstain from destruction of life, abstain from taking what is not given, from sexual misconduct, abstaining from false speech, decisive speech, harsh speech, idle chatter, and also one is developing with all that. If that is developing, strong point, Lord Buddha says, and with those uh, forty qualities that we're giving more. More, more pressure to promote it, to increase uh, the, the focus on, on developing them, then the natural knock-on effect, the Lord Buddha, uh, we can see of the mind will be, he will be one without longing, uh, one of goodwill and holds right view. This will start to establish in the mind yeah, because of that, uh, that, that principle, so speak, principle of speech and bodily conduct are being fulfilled, and it, it means it's ready on them, and it's going to be able to influence the mind more and more. And uh, so it encourages uh, those qualities. <clears throat> so then also to, to show the far-reaching consequences of uh, these 10 wholesome karmas, these 10 unwholesome karmas, the Lord Buddha did on other occasions go um, to, to, to really uh, make it extremely, utterly important. He would say, bhikkhus, I will teach you what is the good, what is the bad, what is noble dhamma, what is the ignoble dhamma, what is the wholesome, what is the unwholesome, what is the beneficial, what is the unbeneficial, what is the dhamma, what is the non-dhamma, what is the tainted dhamma, what is the taintless dhamma, what is the blameworthy dharma? What is the blameless dharma? The dharma that leads to building up, the dharma that leads to dismantling, the dharma with suffering as its outcome. 
the Dharma with happiness as its outcome, the Dharma that results in suffering and the Dharma that results in happiness, the dark path, the bright path, the Dharma of a good person, the Dharma of a bad person, the Dharma to be aroused, the Dharma not to be aroused, the Dharma to be pursued, the Dharma not to be pursued, the Dharma to develop, the Dharma not to develop, the Dharma to be cultivated, the Dharma not to be cultivated, the Dharma to be recollected, the Dharma not to be recollected, the Dharma to be realized, the Dharma not to be realized. Listen and closely pay attention and I will speak. And yes, yes, Bhante. And he would say, again, basically, these ten Akusala Karmas. And that is, um, and what is bad? And then he would go, and what is dumb or what is not? And then he would go, and from the very first point, he would say, what is bad? And that is the destruction of life, taking what is not given, sexual misconduct, so on. And what is good? The non-destruction of life. And then refraining from taking what is not is given and refraining from sexual misconduct. So, and so forth, going into Vajji Kama, going through speech, going through the, the mind, and uh, again. And so, um, so with this, we can see, um, and thus, once we finish going through the wholesome karmas, um, going up to the level of um, what is good, what is bad, so we're going into the, again back to the good and what is the, the right Dhamma or the Dhamma to be realized and so forth. We, uh, we, we finally come to the, uh, again to Mano Kama of Kusala Kama, and that is one who is non -long, no, non longing, goodwill, and of right view. This is called good. So finally it, fend, it ends there, all those lists. So we're just showing how far reaching it is. So sometimes we go, oh, it's just about good and bad, but it's far reaching implications. So. Uh, because it's many aspects of Dharma, it can help and support. You know, one particular was recollection, what to be realized and so forth. So it's showing on a far level, when the mind is developed in mindfulness, this will be established in mind and it will bring a, and it'll be also a support for joy in the mind. <clears throat> so then the deed-born body, because I do not say there is a termination of volitional karma that has been done and accumulated so long as one has not experienced its results. So again, this statement, uh, just going through now with karma, is just showing that even though things have been done in the past, uh, but they have not, uh, we have not re received the results of them. And, uh, and that meaning at this very point, we haven't received the results of them. And so therefore, there is no termination of them. So this karma of the past, we cannot, Terminate. We cannot end completely. It's, it's, this is a very important point that, that breaks Buddhism from the, uh, uh, the external sex at the time of, of the Lord Buddha and even pretty much with maybe some of the beliefs of other religions because of the very fact that karma, we don't know what we've done, but there is definitely some store of karma, but that's not the point because we haven't received the results of it and it's not yet to be... Uh, discerned and also the Lord Buddha says sometimes it's not karma sometimes it's because of health conditions so for example due to uh, due to uh, due to wind due to um, heat uh, bodily disorders and so forth uh, you know so sometimes we think oh I've got such a bad body because of bad karma I've done in the past but sometimes it's not that the case it can be just because the body has some illness and very much or, or so forth some something bad happens it could be just by mere chance and the Lord Buddha says something we cannot quite clearly uh, discern ourselves what is the reason for this bad thing to happen in my life something we cannot clearly see but actually if we develop our meditation and we develop our practice sometimes when we are doing the wrong things consequences happen very quickly and we and if we are very mindful we can see the link because I behaved in that way this is what is coming back as a result and that is excellent because it's showing quite clearly the link of what this relationship is about so we be by doing that we become we develop more skill in developing those wholesome karmas in particular one I would say is speech how many of us have said have gone off and said the wrong thing too quickly and, uh, and, and received uh, a negative feedback straight away because of lack of clearly discerning mindfully, is this appropriate to say that? And you know, we always, you know, 
short fuse, say the wrong thing, the wrong time, and, it, and sometimes it has a direct a negative consequence in the surrounding environment with other people. So, uh, and that may be in this very life, as he was saying, or on some, on you know, we don't know when with that that calm will rise, and that is not the point because it hasn't arisen, and we don't know. But I do say that there is a making an end of suffering so long one has not experienced the results of of of, um, of volitional karma that has been done accumulated. So then, for example, once we're developing these wholesome states of mind, then this then what will happen, what will be more evident is that uh, negative states of mind or negative things will be reducing because there'll be no basis for it because we are supported by these wholesome ten karmas which we are focusing and developing. So, uh, so then, uh, for example, if there is a situation where there's anger and conflict, we're not adding to it. We're very, very neutral, impartial, and trying to sort out the problem. We're very, very mindful and careful. So therefore, we, we leave that feeling no residue, no negativity. That's a, that's a very good example, and that's showing that because of uh, uh, we're making an end to a possibly suffering that could have arisen in that situation because of our behaviour was very mindful and careful, we, we, we avoided it. And, uh, and then because of that, that's where we see uh, this quality of this small nibbana, as we can say, a realisation, a cessation of suffering, where at this moment there is no suffering in the mind. You know, see, so we do some good wholesome action and there's, there's a buoyancy in the mind. There's no negativity in the mind. And that we should pay attention to, not, not just, just uh, uh, negate it or just put it to a side because that, that is leading to very what I'm trying to fundamentally go to the point now to, and that is this noble disciple, Bhikkhu, who thus is devoid of longing, devoid of ill will, which we were talking previously about manokama, devoid of longing, devoid of ill will, unconfused. And there, here, he goes in a bit more detail on this, in this aspect. Unconfused, clearly comprehend, comprehending and mindful. Thus, meaning he has fulfilled some of ayama. The mind has attained a stable, wholesome state of being from moment to moment. Because the mind is no longer confused, it has clear comprehension and is mindful. So when it has these three aspects, then there's no, there's no suffering. There's no suffering can be a, that can touch at that moment. So this is where we're not paying attention enough in these moments where there is no suffering and not paying attention to that. And why is that? Because the mind is always going off into the future, not learning to appreciate the presence of that. And so unconfused, meaning yoni so manas krohi, and this is the quality of what you're doing now, presently paying attention to what is being said, so there's no confusion in the mind. And as I go through step by step through with all the points, and clear, oh, okay, he's linking that now with that. So this is where we are focusing on the Dharma and what has been said, and we're analyzing it and saying, okay, there's no confusion. I know what he's saying and I understand it. And this is what he meant by confusion. There's clarity in the mind. It knows how to discern and think about things and, and, and understand what is, he, what is one's experience of that present moment through the development of these ten kusala karmas, because we're experiencing that. <clears throat> so with that unconfused and then uh, uh, clearly comprehension, which is sati sampajanya, uh, clearly comprehend, meaning it's very quite clear. It's, it's different quality than just mindfulness. It's clarity in a sense that we, we, we quite clearly uh, very circumspect of what is actually happening. It's not just mere mindfulness to say if we touch ourselves and we just touch, okay, I'm, I'm aware of touch, and then the mind is off. For that moment, it's aware of the touch and the mind is thinking. Clear comprehension is very clear of that touch and all the surrounding things that are happening. We're implying that, that my hand is touching, why is the hand in touching, all the surrounding things. Its interest is in that contact, all the things that are creating that contact is understood. So for example, if somebody's angry, we're feeling our anger arise, that's contact. We're seeing that, we're clearly comprehending it, and we're seeing our reaction, and we've 
This is sati sampajanya. This is clear comprehending what is actually happening. Mindfulness is just knowing I feel anger. But clear comprehension is when we can actually break it down. We can break it down a bit more mind moments. We can break it moment by moment what's arising and passing. Another aspect of clear comprehension is seeing the arising and passing. This is a very another important deep profound dharma which leads also the ten of kusala karmas does. And this is all daily activity. So if we really pay attention, there's a lot of dharma going on moment to moment. We just need to just really pay attention. So um, that quality of sati, which is ever mindful, uh, so that's uh, the sense of stability of the mind. So when it says sati or uh, ever or this one of ever mindful, what is it implying there? As I was saying, first we're implying of establishing right, right effort, which was unconfused. So we're establishing right effort. So there's no unwholesome state. Usually confusion is a state of unwholesome. Because why are we confused? Because we don't know good from bad. We don't know how to act. We don't know how to react. We don't know how to promote. And we're confused, basically. But we're unconfused. We're very clear, sharp, decisive. We know what we need to do. And this is leading towards right view. So when, when we are finally established on these three aspects, unconfused, clearly comprehending, and ever mindful, as, uh, as the Lord, Lord Buddha goes in another sutta, in clear precision, uh, and supporting these ten kusala karmas, thus fulfilled in sati, one's mindfully sustaining one's rec recollection of the four foundations of mindfulness. And again, sati is quite a high level. For now, mostly now it's taught that, oh, I have sati, be mindful of my mind, mindful of my body, and so forth. But actually, sati is a high level, and to attain it has to have these qualities of uh, having put away covetous and grief for the world. And again, it does a complete loop and connects with the previous statement of devoid of longing and ill will. So we can see that sati, uh, sama sati is a very high level where the mind has established a wholesome base, you see. So all this talk now, I don't need sila, I can just develop my sati, is absolute rubbish. Because this, you can't even establish the mind. And that's why a lot of people who come new to meditation, who haven't really developed their Buddhist practice yet, um, having so much difficulty in establishing a non-distracted state. And this is our aim and objective, is to get to that level of quality enjoying that quality of the non-distracted state of mind. When we develop that, it brings, it brings such beautiful quality of the mind and it creates a great uh, sense of, wow, what was that? I've never experienced that before in the world. So it's, it's not something where we're normally going out externally, getting material possessions and getting joy from use of material possessions. And again, that is longing, isn't it? That's the mind going out to longing. Here we're just saying, no, I have enough. So with that fully aware and having put away covetous and grief for the world, he dwells pervading the one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness, compassion and sympathetic joy. Equanimous. And the final one is equanimous. And this is very important because that then, that, that, that re-establishes sati. So there's this, these four, which are not, not, as you know, the suttas are very long. If I was to recite a sutta, it will take an hour. So what I've done, as what, what, is, what is all about Dhamma talk is the monk analyzes it and discusses it in detail and gives an understanding of the dynamics and its structure and what its, what its implications are and how we can benefit, how we can use it. So with these four Brahma Viharas, the final one, because we have a choice, we have a selective choice of project, this unconditional loving kindness, this quality of compassion, this quality of sympathetic joy, which is non-jealousy, basically. It's a state of, I'm not jealous of you. Even though I should be, I won't be. Because jealousy leads to hatred, if we observe the mind as it proceeds in this state of jealousy. And also proceeds in a state of longing, obsession with longing as well. So we can see how it's all incredibly interlinked like an incredible DNA structure, you know, these molecules. It's very much, Dharma is much like um, a physicist who talks about universal black holes and things like that. When we analyze it, it's the language of Dharma is very much a physicist language 
and, uh, and it's a very beautiful, and it's something we can experience. It's not these E equals MC square, it's something that is actually happening in our mind as we continually develop. So that's what I wanted to point out, is that when we, when we fulfill the mano karma, these three areas of reducing our longing and reducing our monkey mind from wandering, wanting this, wanting that, and seeing that nature and reducing it and developing contentment in ourselves and who we are with having the basis of a wholesome state of being through body, speech and mind, then we can realise an inner happiness that we didn't experience before. And we can feel confidence because uh, one who has sila law, but it says, is not afraid to come in front of an audience and talk about himself. This is another aspect of sila. Someone who has sila and virtue is not afraid to stand in front of an audience. Someone who's afraid to stand in front of an audience, meaning they still are very not on a level of, of established in sila. So that is the reason. Why are we afraid to stand in front of an audience? Because they're going to say something bad about me or they're going to make fun of me. And again, you see, when we think like that, we, f we have still qualities on the level of mind, ill will, qualities of mind of longing to be something. Yeah? But when we really develop the Dharma, develop the sila, there's a sense of openness, a sense of love, a sense of unconditional love. She's my mother or not. So when I went to visit my mother, seeing her suffering, I looking at the other patients, seeing equally how so much suffering there is. Conditionally having affection for, you know, may you be well, so forth, as well. Of course, of course, my primary objective was to give support to my mother, but not to deny that they have suffering and to not give them a, a sense of respect for their state of being. And again, that's going back to the very first primary aspect of giving. Giving is far-reaching because we can give with our mind and mental, mental states. So then the Lord Buddha does make it uh, an area for us to explore. Once we're established in our, in our mindfulness, we can explore what, what area do we feel we're more inclined to. Some are inclined to compassion. And we can see that, let's say, with, uh, with the Tibetan monks. This is one of their main principles that they practice is compassion. You know, great, this great compassion. And this is the Mahayana vehicle, which they promote very highly, is this sense of, we will not attain enlightenment until all beings are released from suffering. Okay, that's their take. And I'm not denying that. I just that's it's that's something that's just giving you a point of where you know we're going to help all beings and help everyone and develop this power for compassion. But some of us may be more on the level of uh, working with uh, loving kindness. This sense of uh, you know just metta, and I think that's more in Theravadan scriptures mostly, especially Sri Lankan, is this, this sense of mental goodwill, harmony, you know, this quality of goodwill and uh, sort of uh, unity. And now I can see that much in Asia is a very much important primary aspect of goodwill. And then there's a much more not so well-known one, sympathetic joy, mudita, but also very important, which is uh, the Lord Buddha says it's a form of merit as well. It's just allowing people, respecting the good of others. As actual fact, it's a, a very... It's very dark karma where we do not acknowledge the good of others. We do not acknowledge. They do something good and we say, oh, they're doing that. You know, like they're cleaning. Let's say if somebody's cleaning this carpet and we go, oh, he's the cleaner. He's just the cleaner. But we don't. We have to think that person has sacrificed his time to come here on Monday to clean four hours. Are you doing that? No. So why are you just saying he's just the cleaner? You know, if he didn't come, this hall wouldn't be clean. You know, no one's paying this. And it's very important. The committee has kept this statement that this is a dharma. This centre is a dharma centre and we want to support dharma of the Theravadan tradition based in these fundamental principles of Lord Buddha and acknowledging and showing great respect for them. And that's why I, I really uh, praise this centre for that because it's rare. I think there are not many centres... Uh, uh, around the world that really put themselves out that so much where um, you know they're trying to do so much good and of course they're always trying to raise funds so should really acknowledge they're trying to do good and also trying to uh, establish uh, some monastery to support the center as well it's, it's wonderful to see how much they're really trying to establish Dharma in the world 
and give opportunity for Sangha also to come, like there's a resident Vihara. So um, I just wanted to just point out that's the power of these tentacles of karmas, that's what it's leading to us to, is developing, uh, developing our uh, establishing right effort in knowing from the unwholesome to the wholesome, and then from that we move into mindfulness, where our mindfulness is firm and unwavering, and not, and from moment to moment we're seeing no unwholesome states arising, no negativity at all. And if there are, they quickly reduce because we're already on that high level. As soon as it arises, as soon as we see it, it disappears. This is another aspect of sati. When we see something unwholesome and our mind is mindful, when we observe it, it disappears. But if we observe it and it doesn't disappear, we are actually, we are actually in ourselves still promoting it, still, uh, still uh, have a perverted view, basically. And this is what we see. Over, I can say for myself now as a Buddhist practitioner, monk, for more than uh, 12, 13, 14 years, the mind, how much it's refined in those years is incredible. Some of the thoughts that bothered me when I was a young monk hardly ever happen now. And even if I try to think those thoughts for like a test, some unwholesome thoughts, they don't even come because they're just so gross. I don't want to even think about them. Even when I do a little test, oh, maybe I'll try to think that way. I mean, I don't want to. It's awful. And this is what the fear, we slowly refine and refine our Buddhist practice and develop it. And that's the beauty of it. So then when we are developing meditation, it will start to develop and we'll be develop much skill and we'll be intuitive with it. We'll be exploring it and developing mindfulness. So I think I better stop there. There might be one or two questions. So and I'm honored for coming and listening and I hope you develop your ten Kusala Kamas. Mantha, you mentioned about uh, the, the temporary state of Nibbana of the mind, void of uh, longing and ill will. May I add that void of longing, ill will, and view of non-self? Yes, that's right. Yeah, you can. You can definitely uh, say that. But uh, that, that is uh, something that will be, uh, once the, the four Brahma Viharas are established, that will be quite clear because they are... Uh, a selfless core to them because we're very, very simple. the very first one, metta, is unconditional, meaning there's no relationship, my mother, this person, that. It's having metta for all equally and so forth. And same is compassion, not just compassion for my mother, but for all, you know. So that quality, when we are developing that, it's quite clear if we take away that strong relationship and, and pushing away something that we don't want to acknowledge, uh, sort of like selfishly focusing on what we want. What, that's what usually love is about in the world. It's a desire, an attachment for something, and a denial of something else, you know, so forth. But if it's developing on that level, then um, uh, like I talked with some Westerners yesterday at Dan, I said, uh, basically, if, if you, uh, they had some young family, and I said, you know, how do we uh, promote more affection? I said, if you love someone, Set. There's a famous police song. If you love someone from the 80s, you set them free. And, you know, and, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful statement, and it's very much close to that quality. Is that you give trust, you give them trust, and you develop that relationship, and that trust relationship. And and also with deceased ones, if if they passed away, instead of worrying, being sad about them, you you set them free. You give them your 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 loving kindness, your good thoughts. You, may you may you carry on, go. You know, even though I miss you, but I wish you all the best, and that's and that's that's beautiful. So yeah, so definitely that's correct. Yeah, the, the, the mind will come to this state of this uh, less sense of me, mine, myself quality. Very good, but it's actually not pointed out there. But that's what it's implying as well. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> oh, we have another one. <laughs> You're talking about the altruistic joy. Yeah. And if you are a wise person, yes. if you are a thinking person, I mean, we always rejoice in our gain, yeah. or somebody close to us. We, why shouldn't we not be rejoice in somebody else's gain? Because it is fantastic to, it is, in, if you really, it's about the mind, isn't it? Yes, yeah. If you can rejoice on anything that you see, yeah. why shouldn't we? If you are wise, you should do it all the time, isn't it? Yep. Autistic joy. Yeah. I mean, wise man's behavior is that you get happiness from everything. Yeah, yeah. Not with... Something belongs to you from some, uh, somebody yeah. else as well. Yeah, 
it's because the nature of the mind, desire and attachment is so strong. That's how now I use it now to, with the Western people. I don't say, in Thai we say kilesa or defilement, but I try to go to a much more, uh, more to the point, desire and attachment. And this desire and attachment we see there, that is what's pulling us in a certain way and uh, creating uh, uh, this, uh, this cycle where there's going to be a, 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 you know, sadness, grief and so forth, you know. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, having put away covetous and grief of the world. It's just basically saying it's a complete cycle. We have longing and then what'll, it'll eventually turn into grief at some point or grief and we can see that. Well, um, uh, so yes, yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> That's the, the main point. And so when we are trying to altruistic joy or sympathetic joy, is uh, we just have to constantly try to establish mindfulness because it's a very high level. These four Brahma Viharas is something which is a lot of people try to promote much more on a mundane level. That's very good to counteract negative aspects like having metta instead of having ill will, have goodwill and so forth to develop it. But on a very high level, they are very, uh, very sublime states that lead to uh, a non-distracted state or can maintain it. And if somebody maintains it, they will not fall from that. And, uh, and if they were to uh, pass away from this world, they might not return, such as in the Karina Metta Sutta, the final statement saying, never to be born in any womb again, implying they have attained Arya. They will not come back. They are an Arya and of a high level. <clears throat> So that's the power of those uh, Brahma Viharas. Uh, yeah, I was curious too, you know, you said that the Tibetan Mahayana. Yes. It's, it's all about um, removing suffering from all the world. Yes. But that's pretty over ambitious, right? I mean, that's not going to happen. How are they going to achieve that? That's, um, they, they, that was not the objective of the talk. I was just trying to find find something to explain how different preferences people would have. So just saying, taking just compassion to its, to its, to its extreme, to its, you know, to its fullest point, exploring that, and that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing, and uh, you can see with a lot of the stories of the monks there how much suffering they've been in, in, in jail or they've been tortured and things like that, and making statements that that they were afraid, even for one mind moment, to feel any anger towards their torturer, you know. So, so that's quite, uh, quite uh, showing that they must be pretty advanced in their practice, they're able to stabilize that and to develop that. So uh, they, they, they're very goal-orientated in this style, and, um, and you know, I respect that. That's, that you know, Buddhism has developed and flourished into different traditions, and that's natural. And, 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 but, uh, that's the beauty of Buddhism. We can't, but but the main thing is we have the core teachings. All the different traditions have the core teachings and so forth. So there's no need. And as Lord Buddha says, we try to keep harmony. We don't try to say I'm better. Our tradition's better on that. It's just complementary. We're just seeing different ways of practicing and allowing people to 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 feel the infinity with. I, for myself, personally feel much great support in the Theravadan tradition. I feel. Uh, uh, for me, it's, uh, I always felt much more infinity with it, so, yes. But I do appreciate other traditions, of course. There's uh, one question from online here. Um, it's from James. The Buddha says, None, no harm to all sentient beings. How do Buddhists receive, resolve eating meat? Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a difficult area because um, karma is uh is uh made intentionally so if so um meat when he said meat he's got to be quite clear if we're analyzing that sentence as as we should when we when we're talking language or studying we should analyze the words and what is it how it's using it's not saying an animal he's saying meat meat implies it's not alive it's just a piece of flesh okay that flesh has been killed previously but maybe it didn't, he did not say anything about how it was killed or who killed it or was it given to me, killed for me or something like that. It's just meat. So then there's no karma to be made in that sense. It's just meat. It's like you go to a supermarket, it's just meat there. You didn't ask him, you didn't order it, it's just there. Whether you want it or not, it's there because there's a large majority of people that do eat meat and maybe they have a dietary need for it and so forth. 
So the main, main point that we're trying to see here is karma is the first one, destruction of life, is that we intentionally ourselves harm a being. You know, like, for example, you know, even like, a, like in Thailand now, we have Gengi fever, these mosquitoes that if they bite you, give you this nasty malaria, you know. And, uh, you know, so, but monks, we say, just don't be out in dawn and dusk because that's when the female mosquitoes come out to, uh, to bite you. It's pretty much then, those two periods. And so, or use your glot. We have a mosquito glot. Use preventive measures. So this is how even where most people, the laity, will, will you know, do that. Will, you, know, you know, it's even, they've got even advertising to, to kill it. The government gives advertising to kill it, spray it, so forth. That's the way they do it. But for some, but that's, that's a choice. It's not, it's okay, I can understand for health and safety, but it but doesn't mean we have to all do at that level, you know. So, uh, so maybe that's going off the point, but I just want to point out that uh, it's, it's a very much a personal choice and we can't change the society, can't, and that's not what Buddhism is about. We don't go door knocking, we don't get involved in government, things like that. And there was so much, uh, uh, so much uh, confusion at the time, the Buddha, so much um, unharmoniousness and all these different ascetic ascetism groups were even doing very evil things, you know, like, so, um, but the Lord Buddha remained equanimous and saw that karma is made by the individual and it's something I cannot get involved in, I cannot intervene with and, and, and to stop, it's beyond my reach. So it's only very few incidents that the Lord Buddha did intervene. And there's one I use, Angulimala, who was killing, but for not because of, uh, of, out of hatred or ill will, but because of his teacher, because he belonged, belonged to a tradition to say so. And he thought this, but he, he was totally, had no understanding of what is right and wrong. It was very confused at that time of India. They had so many strange beliefs. So that's why these tentacles of karma are very important for us to remember because they're the basis of all the Buddhas. It's the basis of the true Dharma. It's part of the, the Sahara Dhammas, the true Dharmas, that are never wrong, never, never to be blamed. And so with that, he intervened and uh, because the last person that he was going to, t uh, to take life was his mother, because he had, a, he, had to, he had a, what you say, had a quota he had to fill from his religious teacher, so to speak. And, and, and the, when stopping there, the Lord Buddha stopped him and with the beautiful Dharma sayings, and he realized, you know, he was doing something incredibly unwholesome. And then through that, he developed his practice with the Lord Buddha, became a monk, and, uh, and, uh, and attained Arahant. So even though he had harmed, killed many people. But that last person, if he had killed his mother, he would not be open to Aryan. The gates would be closed. That's why, you know, upholding mother and father, ma ta pita upatana, is never to harm mother and father. Lord Buddha says the karma, the consequences of harming one's mother and father is very heavy. It's an antikirya karma. It's a karma you shouldn't do, because if you do that, you close the door for development. You cannot attain Arya. Even though maybe your mother and father are not so nice to you, but that's not the point. It's a fact is you are developing your Buddhist practice. You're looking after your mind, and this is what the primary objective is in Buddhism. We are concerned about my own mind, looking after it and promoting that in society. So if you don't want to buy meat, that's fine. You know, you don't buy it, you just eat vegetarian. The Lord Buddha says there's always going to be problems in society. People are always going to, you know, do unwholesome things. You're not going to be totally free of it. And this is the world of samsawata. This is the wheel of samsara. It's the wheel of existence. And this is why we should aspire for Nibbāna, true peace, because of, uh, we don't want to go into states of woe and deprivation. So that's why we're developing this intention that, okay, if we do buy meat in a supermarket, that's a choice, but there's no karma to be made there. Okay? So that's the main point of that. <clears throat> Good, all right. So, uh, so we'll just do the uh, paying respects to the Triple Gem and, uh, and then we will get ready for the lunch dana. So, so Anamodana for coming and listening to the Dharma and uh, may you have a lovely day, okay?